4th of June, being Monday morning, on the second day of Whitsuntide, with a bright clear full moon about two hours before daybreak during the watch of the skipper, I was lying in my bunk feeling ill and felt suddenly, with a rough terrible movement, the bumping of the ship's rudder and immediately after that I felt the ship held up in her course against the rocks so that I fell out of my berth, whereon I ran up and discovered that all the sails were in top, the wind southwest, the course northeast by north during that night, and were lying right in the middle of a thick spray. Round the ship there was only a little surf, but shortly after that one could hear the sea breaking hard round it. I said, Skipper, what have you done, that through your reckless carelessness you have run this noose around our necks? He answered, How could I do better? I did not sleep, but watched out very well, for when I saw the breakers in the distance, I asked Hans the gunner, what can that be? Whereupon he said, Skipper, it is the shine of the moon, upon which I trusted. I asked him some advice now, whereabouts he thought we were. He said, that only God knows. This is a shallow that must be lying quite a distance from the unknown land. And I think we are just on the tail of it. These words were taken from the journal of Francisco Pelsart, upper merchant of the ship Batavia of the Dutch East India Company. Pelsart was in overall command of this fateful voyage, but little did he know at the time. Wrecking his ship on a reef was just the beginning of a nightmare for those on board. Batavia's Graveyard, today, on Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs. Welcome to Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs, Tales of Mishaps, Misfortune, and Misadventures. This episode tells the story of the Batavia. This is probably the most bizarre and disturbing shipwreck story that I have come across. It has a little bit of everything. Religious factions, strange medical practices, greed, corruption, scurvy, mutiny, treasure, sexual assault, torture, murder, executions, and of course... A shipwreck. You'll be introduced to a truly fiendish villain for the ages, Hieronymus Cornelis. Before we jump into this story, I need to communicate a few things to you. This episode does not use explicit language, but does contain adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. The Batavia wreck just off the coast of Western Australia, and a very small portion of the story involves the mainland of Australia. I recognize the First Nations of Australia as the original caretakers of that land, and their deep connection to it. Nothing that I describe here is meant to glorify or defend the colonialism that took place in Australia or its neighboring islands. Also, there will be many Dutch names of people and places, and I'll do my best to pronounce them. I even consulted the Dutch language subreddit for advice. Native Dutch speakers will probably cringe, but I promise I am trying my best. I'm very excited to have had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Howard Gray, one of the world's foremost experts on the Batavia shipwreck and the Hauptman Abrojos Archipelago. Dr. Gray is an author, lecturer, historian, and chair of the Batavia Coast Maritime Heritage Association, and we will hear from him extensively throughout this episode. With all of that out of the way, let's jump in to this crazy story of the Batavia. Any discussion about the Batavia is going to require a bit of background about the Dutch East India Company, which we will start in Amsterdam. Before 1500, Amsterdam was a small and fairly insignificant town with an unfavorable climate. But by 1500, it had started to emerge as an efficient shipping port. When the Eighty Years' War began in 1572 between the Dutch and Spain, Many Protestants in the Spanish and Catholic-dominated Southern Netherlands fled to the Protestant Northern provinces, primarily Holland, and specifically the city of Amsterdam. 
Many of these refugees were also savvy merchants who then set up their businesses in Amsterdam. In 1588, the Spanish Armada was famously destroyed, leaving a hefty naval power vacuum. In addition, by 1600, the population of Amsterdam had doubled from 30,000 to 60,000. By the time of the Batavia voyage in 1628, Amsterdam had boomed to a population of 110,000. Going back to 1494, the Treaty of Tordesillas, sponsored by Pope Alexander VI, gave control of all undiscovered territories west of the Cape Verdes Islands, off the western coast of Africa, to Spain, and everything east of those islands to Portugal. The Portuguese established the route to the east, going south around the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa, then hugging the coast up eastern Africa, and then west toward India. This journey took about a year, and diseases such as scurvy and dysentery were common, and the lack of fresh food and fresh water were a serious problem. These routes, called rudders, were heavily guarded secrets of the Portuguese and Spanish. Captains were under standing orders to burn or otherwise destroy these navigation instructions when in danger of being captured or shipwrecked. Other powers, such as the English, Dutch, and French, often sent spies to attempt to discover these secret routes to the east. In 1592, a Dutchman named Jan Huygen van Lieshoten returned to Amsterdam after spending time in Portugal and the Azores. He became fluent in Portuguese and befriended many noblemen but more importantly, sailors who knew the navigational secrets of the Portuguese. He learned these rudders to the east and then published them in a series of books in 1595. Later that year, the first Dutch venture to the East Indies was launched, called the First Fleet, using Van Lieshoten's navigational instructions. After a series of disasters and missteps, including being attacked by the Javanese, the first fleet limped back to the Netherlands without establishing trade relationships in the East Indies. They would arrive in Amsterdam with only enough spice to break even. Undeterred and with more knowledge and experience, another fleet was launched and returned with far more profit. Soon, many competing ventures were sponsored by merchants, all seeking trade with the East. Groups of merchants sponsored fleets hoping to make a good return on their investments. Dozens of competing Dutch interests were all trying to make their fortunes in the spice trade. So you might ask, what is spice? The answer involves rotten meat. Preserving meat at that time was not widely known, so butchers largely had rotting meat for sale. It smelled bad and tasted worse. Spices such as pepper, among others, were used to rub on the meat and mask the smell and taste allowing them to sell the rotten meat and not lose out on profits. Other spices, such as clove and nutmeg, were also brought back from the Spice Islands to improve the taste of food. By 1601, all of the different Dutch merchant fleets had caused such competition with each other that it had driven up the cost of spices drastically. Profits were suffering. The various syndicates sending fleets to the east decided to merge their efforts. And after much negotiation, the Verenigde Oostendisch Company, or the VOC as I will call it from here on out, was formed. The VOC allowed hundreds of merchants all over the Republic to invest in the company, which provided hundreds of ships to minimize the risk. The VOC began as a private merchant company and was granted a 21-year exclusive contract by the Dutch government for spice trading in the Dutch East Indies and surrounding areas in what is now the Republic of Indonesia. The VOC was established in 1602. Each of the states in the Republic had a local chamber of the VOC, which controlled business in their region. The primary headquarters of the VOC in the East Indies was a settlement they named Batavia. This was located in what is now Jakarta on the island of Java. In 1611, VOC skipper Hendrik Brouwer discovered a new route to Southeast Asia which differed from the popular Portuguese route. This new route used the Roaring Forties jet stream across the southern Indian Ocean instead of hugging the east coast of Africa and then east across the northern Indian Ocean. This allowed for a much faster journey, cutting the length in half to six months. Soon after, the VOC directed all of its ships to use Brower's route, demanding captains seek, quote, latitudes of 35, 
36, 40 to 44 degrees south, depending on where the seaman can find the best winds. It continues. Now after the west winds have been found, the ship should sail eastwards for at least 1,000 million, about 7,000 kilometers, before turning and laying their course for the north. This new route was shorter and faster, but did not come without its own risks, as we shall see. The VOC commanded about 5,000 ships and transformed Amsterdam into a major international trading hub, raking in massive profits. The Dutch soon dominated Asian trading and established themselves from the Arabian Peninsula to Japan. Trade deals with the local tribes and the Mughal Empire in India, as well as fixing lower prices, drove the Portuguese from the area and established a virtual monopoly in the spice trade. During this time, the VOC sent over a million people to Asia, which was more than all other European countries combined. The VOC even protested to the Dutch government that the lands they had seized were privately owned by the VOC and not part of the Dutch Empire. Governor General Jan Peterson Kuhn was a particularly brutal man and had been previously fired by the VOC before being rehired. After all, while being a horrific monster, he produced fantastic profits for the company. The VOC was at that time the largest and most profitable company in the world and is still considered to be one of the largest companies to ever exist in history. The governing body of the company was a 17-person board called the 17 Gentlemen, which decided all of its ventures. Once a mission was assigned to a ship, an upper merchant was chosen who was the overall commander of the fleet and responsible for all the cargo on board. The under merchant was responsible for buying and selling the cargo at advantageous prices to maximize profits. The Dutch traded materials such as textiles, coffee, and silver for nutmeg, cinnamon, and pepper. The captain or skipper of a VOC ship was responsible for navigation of the ship and other maritime matters. The Batavia was commissioned by the VOC and built in 1628 as the company's new flagship. It was a beautiful ship, 160 feet long, with an outer hull of pine to prevent shipworms. It was painted in a stunning red and green, had four decks, three masts, and 30 cannon, and included an elaborate carving of a roaring lion on the bow of the ship. Dutch ships at that time were considered more modern and efficient than the British or Portuguese ships. They were large, sturdy, and built to last. A Dutch East Indiaman, as these ships were called, typically could last up to six round-trip voyages to the east. The upper merchant chosen to command the Batavia and its fleet was Francisco Pelsart. He was born in Antwerp to a Catholic family and was just five years old when his father died. His mother then remarried and left young Francisco to be raised by his grandfather. When his grandfather died, Francisco was left with nothing and no family to turn to. Without any remaining ties to Antwerp, he left for Amsterdam in hopes of better fortunes. Pelsart found himself in Amsterdam with close to nothing, and like many others who were desperate, he turned to the VOC. But Pelsart was a Catholic from the southern region of the Netherlands, which was under Spanish control. Spain was in the midst of the Eighty Years' War with the Protestant Northern Netherlands states, and the VOC, located in Amsterdam, only hired Protestants from the northern states. Badly needing work, Pelsart seemingly set aside his Catholicism and claimed to be Protestant. Pelsart joined the VOC in 1615 with the low rank of assistant, and by 1620 he was sent to the city of Surat in India as a lower merchant to establish trade relations with the extremely wealthy Mughal Empire. By 1624, he was promoted to upper merchant who was sent to the city of Agra to command the mission to the imperial court of the Mughal Empire. Pelsart quickly developed a reputation as a bit of a scoundrel, he was known for sleeping with slaves, married noble women, local peasants, and any manner of women. He wasn't very particular and had a voracious sexual appetite. It was not uncommon for the Dutch men in Asia to have sexual encounters with the local women, but Pelsart did not seem to care who he betted or what the consequences might be. Francisco had an affair with the wife of one of the richest nobles in the Mughal Empire, 
and was even so bold as to bring her to his home. She discovered a bottle of clove oil in his home, which was used as a stimulant in very small amounts to those who were extremely ill. Mistaking it for wine, she drank a large quantity and died almost instantly. Fearing a scandal and other consequences, Pelsart buried her body without being seen, but a local merchant discovered the truth and blackmailed the VOC in order to profit from the situation. This was just the first time Pelsart became embroiled in controversy with the VOC. While the investors back in the Netherlands were raking in huge profits, sometimes up to a thousand percent returns, the merchants and officers aboard VOC ships were not well paid and rarely received bonuses. Like many others, Pelsart made money under the table by buying goods at a low price, claiming they were bought at a higher price, and then pocketing the difference. He also engaged in money lending, using company money to lend out to locals at a high interest and keeping the profits for himself. These loans were not always paid back, but he considered it a loss for the company and not him personally. These financial exploits were not discovered until much later, but there was a growing suspicion of his activities during his time with the VOC. In 1626, his three-year contract ended, and despite his successes and the profits he made for the company, he was not offered an extension. While his commercial success at Agra was noted, he was seen as a poor diplomat and failed to establish a strong Dutch presence in the Mughal courts. An influential Dutch merchant in Surat, Pieter van der Broek, thought Pelzart lacked the skills to be an effective ambassador and assigned another man to lead a mission to the Mughal court instead. To add insult to injury, this other man was paid twice as much as Pelzart was earning. Pelsart was furious and promptly returned to Surat to confront Vandenbreck. Angry and in a foul mood, he boarded the Dordrecht to await the voyage back to the Netherlands. Pelsart returned to the Netherlands and successfully defended his reputation to the 17 gentlemen. The board was impressed enough with Pelsart to appoint him as upper merchant of the Batavia in 1628. The VOC also sent a letter to Governor General Kuhn in Batavia, writing, Because we have heard very good reports of his previous service, we therefore recommend him to your honor, hereby asking you to keep in mind this person and advance the said Pelsart. To such a position, his conduct and quality shall merit. The skipper assigned to the Batavia was Ariane Jacobs. He was a respected and experienced middle-aged sailor who had navigated many successful voyages east by the time he boarded the Batavia. VOC records show he was known to be quick-tempered, easily offended, and stubborn. He also tended to drink to excess and he was accustomed to being very forward and aggressive with females aboard his ships. He had a reputation as an alcoholic. And after spending 10 years in the very hot, humid, and rough climate of the Dutch East Indies, this was not entirely uncommon. Francisco Pelsart and Ariane Jacobs had previously met each other in Dutch Surat, on the west coast of central India. This encounter was not pleasant. Here's Dr. Howard Gray. Yes, so Pelsart himself had been involved in um, the VOC's activities in India, and he was very, very prominent there in what is, was the indigo trade and made some great advances for the VOC and that in taking over the trade there. But when his time was up, it was time for him to go back to the Netherlands, and apparently on that return voyage, Arian Jacobs was um, was on board that voyage as well, as well and um, they fell out shortly after they got underway, and so there was this lingering sort of tension between them that had I, can, I guess you can imagine being on a ship with somebody you don't get along with or somebody you disagree with for, you know, for long periods of time. You know, the trip back home then was from India around the Cape of uh, Good Hope and uh, all the way back up was a very long voyage home. So, you know, tensions of that sort could really brew. And so when they found themselves together, um, quite unknowingly apparently, it, um, that this was going to happen, but found themselves on board together on the Batavia of course, there was this lingering resentment or antagonism between them. 
The undermerchant assigned to the Batavia was Hieronymus Cornelis. He was most probably born around 1598 in Friesland, a northern state of the Netherlands that was historically very isolated. The Frisians generally disliked the Dutch, had different customs, and most Frisians were Anabaptists, not Calvinists like those in Holland. Anabaptists were pacifists who believed in adult baptism and an impending judgment day. Modern-day Mennonites are an offshoot of Anabaptists. They were considered a radical movement by the Catholic Church, as well as other Protestants. Cornelis was raised in a devout family who lived according to these beliefs. Cornelis chose at an early age to study to be an apothecary like his father. He left his home in Friesland most likely after he had a bitter disagreement with local government officials. He moved himself to Harlem, a sizable and wealthy town in comparison, and he opened his own apothecary shop as a member of the merchant community sometime around 1625. He married a Mennonite woman named Belitia Jakobsdotter around this time. She soon became pregnant, but was incredibly ill for the duration of the pregnancy. Cornelis hired a midwife to help. Suffering from fits of delusions, she was almost constantly dancing and singing all around the house. The woman slept with an ax next to her bed and even left part of Belitia's placenta inside the womb. The new mother suffered horribly and developed purpural fever, an infection from unsanitary conditions. Belitia would recover, but the story gets even more bizarre. Belitia was too ill from the infection caused by the incompetent lunatic midwife. She could not produce milk for the child, so Hieronymus hired an old woman to come to the house and suckle his wife's breasts in order to stimulate milk production. Perhaps shocking by today's standards, but it was not uncommon in the 17th century. Already having gone through troubled times, it was about to get worse for Cornelis. He hired another local woman who lived in an alleyway to be a wet nurse who had a rather dodgy reputation. In his book, Batavia's Graveyard, author Mike Dash writes, the least inquiry among her neighbors and acquaintances would have revealed her as a woman of hot temper and low morals, who was known to be unfaithful to her husband and who suffered from a mysterious and long-term illness. Predictably, the child was soon very sick and not long after, he was dead. It was a mystery at first as to what had caused the baby's illness and death. After some inquiry, it was determined that the child died of syphilis. Hieronymus claimed the child contracted syphilis from the wet nurse, and it's likely this was true, but his reputation was ruined. People even back then weren't crazy about getting medicinal products from a man who reportedly may have syphilis. His family and his business were in tatters. He was in massive debt to another merchant named Loth Vogel. He was forced to sign over his apothecary shop and all of his assets to this creditor in order to avoid bankruptcy, as bankruptcy was seen by the Dutch as a mortal sin. Cornelis was also an alleged associate to painter Johannes van der Beek, who had been sentenced to 20 years in prison months before the voyage of the Batavia, for multiple charges of heresy, including being a part of the Rosicrucian order, a religion believing in ancient mysticism and knowledge. Van der Beek was also known as a libertine. The libertine movement is described as being devoid of all moral principles, focusing on the pleasures of the five senses. This group enjoyed any pleasures they desired, whenever they wanted. This included things such as orgies, excessive drinking, feasts, and other acts considered to be hedonistic. The Marquis de Sade was another famous figure of the libertine movement, and sadism is named after him. Everyone associated with Van der Beek was given a few weeks to settle their affairs and leave town. During this grace period, Cornelis transferred all of his assets to his creditor, left his distraught wife, and headed for Amsterdam. I think that it's, it's around, around that circumstantial evidence that puts them together in the same uh, sorts of locations and the same sorts of so social circumstances. So, yeah, that direct evidence uh, is there, but of course... What it also plays into is that given uh, that Van der Beek had been sort of into, into such trial, you know, and uh, Geronimus Cornelis was, was taking the opportunity to get out of town, if you like, to make sure that he didn't get caught up in it because it may be he was a little bit closer to it than that. 
Vanderbeek was tried and convicted of heresy and sentenced to 20 years in prison, but only served two years before being pardoned by King Charles I of England. Being completely broke and ashamed, and perhaps fleeing the law for his alleged relationship with Vanderbeek, Cornelis joined on with the Dutch East India Company, out of desperation to try to make a little money. Hieronymus was a man of higher status than Pelsart, Jacobs, and all the other officers aboard the Batavia. He saw the rest of the crew as rabble, people he would never have associated with in the outside world. Being of such status and education, he was appointed to an unusually high starting position as undermerchant. To call the crew and other people on board rabble wasn't far from the truth. Men who decided to sail to the East Indies were typically desperate, violent, and undesirable. Sailing to the East Indies was dangerous, the voyage very long, disease is common, and even those who make it there must survive the brutal climate and conditions. The upper merchants, lower merchants, and their assistants alike were typically men who were down on their luck as well. Some were bankrupt or in debt, like Cornelis. Others were disgraced or shunned from society for one reason or another, also like Cornelis. Those aboard a VOC ship were of the most desperate sort. Mike Dash writes, In the popular perception, the company was, in one contemporary's opinion, a great refuge for all spoiled brats, bankrupts, cashiers, brokers, tenants, bailiffs, informers, and such like rakes. One hundred soldiers were also aboard, on their way to garrison the Citadel in Batavia, and could help in the event of an attack. They were housed in the hull of the ship, which had no windows, virtually no ventilation, and the ceiling was so low, men could not stand up straight. They often were forced to stay in the hull for days on end, only being allowed two 30-minute breaks on deck. Fear of the soldier staging a mutiny was very high. Also on board the Batavia were 50 passengers, including 22 women, most of them wives and children of the crew. Having this many women aboard a VOC ship was highly unusual. One of the women on board was Lucretia van der Meilen. She was commonly referred to as Kresia Jans. Yes, she herself, in fact, could have been quite well off, but her husband, his business really wasn't, um, which I think understand was in, in, into the jewellery sort of side of things, but he took this position with the VOC and he'd taken off to Batavia. So she, she was left behind with her children, and one by one they died. And so it, she found herself with no living relatives, her husband in, the, um, in Batavia, and her children in the graveyard. And so she then took the opportunity to say, well, you know, I think I'll go and join my, join my husband in the um, East Indies and um, see how that turns out. So that seems to be the situation with her. You know, there was no reason, for, nothing for her at home. She was in a really difficult situation, you know, you can imagine emotionally and personally with all that trauma around her. And so she um, thought, well, here's this beautiful new ship, the Batavia, you know, I'll jump on board that and sail off and join my husband for a little while while he finishes his contract out there. From all of the things that you see, it would seem that she was a a fairly intelligent woman, and I guess um, the emotional state would have been went pretty awful. You lose your children. I may say death was a very, you know, visited people very frequently in those days. And whether there was a degree of naivety about what these voyages entailed and what the East Indies entailed, because the survival rate just from the voyages and then in the East Indies was 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 dismal, you know. It was you could probably have at least a thirty percent chance of sort of not returning home, if not if not much greater, in fact. So how aware they were of that, I'm not sure. Maybe it wasn't talked about a lot down the waterfront, where they're trying to recruit crew and such like. You know, kind of all of the possibilities of what's going to go wrong. You're going to build it up into something quite exciting, and um, and there may have been, you know, I guess you know she wasn't. Terribly old in the thirties, I think, and that would have been. Um, there might have been some sense of adventure there as well. You know, even today we we still undertake these sorts of little little things, heading off into the unknown, thinking, "Well, this looks like an adventure. Let's hope it all turns out well." Joining Lucretia was her servant and chaperone, Zwantia Hendricks. Based on the records, it appears these two women were not previous acquaintances, 
and Zwancho may have been hired shortly before the voyage to accompany and chaperone Crezia aboard a ship full of men. As it turns out, these two women would not like each other very much. Another important figure on board was Gilbert Bastians, a Calvinist predicant or minister. He was a man of modest means and education, and like others on the Batavia, desperately needed money. He was a rather unremarkable man, but certainly devout. The Batavia was only meant to hold 300, yet a total of 341 people were on board. While being one of the largest ships in the fleet, and very modern, it was surprisingly small compared to today's standards, and was extremely congested with the crew, passengers, and cargo. The 17 gentlemen had appointed Jacques Spex the commander of the fleet, with Pelsart remaining upper merchant of the Batavia. However, Spex was recalled back to Amsterdam on business. It was decided that 11 ships in the fleet would wait and sail with Spex about a month later. The remaining seven ships would sail immediately with Pelsart the commander of this smaller fleet. Loading the cargo took many weeks. There were tons of cheese, meat, fish, butter, beans, water, beer, and livestock. The crew even grew onions and carrots aboard the ship. The Batavia was carrying a large quantity of silver coins, about $8 million worth of silver in today's money. These 12 chests full of silver were kept in the captain's cabin and was guarded by soldiers. The total value of the ship's cargo was worth about $11 million, it was the most valuable cargo ever loaded on a ship to that point. Pelzard himself had four chests filled with jewels on the ship that he intended to sell in Batavia for his own personal profit. This was not exactly allowed by the VOC. However, it happened frequently and was often overlooked as long as the VOC made their money. In the cargo, the ship was loaded with 137 sandstone blocks that Governor General Kuhn was going to use to build an archway at the Citadel in Batavia. The top officers were given luxurious cabins at the stern of the ship, and the skipper Jacobs had the nicest of the cabins. It was the only cabin with windows, and it could be barricaded in case of mutiny. Pelzart and Cornelis had private cabins of their own, with their staff generally sharing smaller cabins. All officers and their assistants had cabins behind the mast, meaning it was aft of the main mast, and regular crew were not permitted to be behind the main mast unless their duties required it. This was primarily to avoid mutiny, which was always a threat aboard VOC ships. The rest of the crew had small, dirty, and smelly cramped rooms infested with vermin, insects, with little ventilation. The VOC had strict rules about their ships. The punishment for swearing, drunkenness, and urinating was flogging. Anyone caught fighting would have their hand nailed to the mast and was only freed by tearing his hand away. Disobey the captain's orders, commit murder, sodomy, or start a mutiny? That's a death sentence. Punishment was decided by the ship's council, which included the upper merchant, skipper, provost, high boatswain, and upper steersman. Before leaving, all crew had to swear an oath of allegiance to the VOC. This would not be the last oath of allegiance that they would have to swear. On October 28, 1628, the fleet left the island of Tissel in Holland, but without the Batavia. The Batavia was the largest ship, and its draft would leave the other ships unable to leave the harbor. There may also have been some delays in loading the ship with its cargo. The Batavia left at 9 a.m. the following morning on October 29th and entered the North Sea, and it soon caught up with the fleet of smaller ships. After just one day, the Batavia ran into violent storms in the North Sea, and she ran aground on the notoriously dangerous Valkyren sandbanks just off the Dutch coast. The Batavia became stranded at low tide, stuck firmly and battered by crashing waves and strong winds. Jakob's experience paid off, and he ordered the crew to immediately lower the sails and adjust the ballast to avoid tipping over. When the storm died down and high tide rolled in, 
the crew was able to get the ship free, and they repaired the minor damage to the hull. A day later, on October 30th, the Batavia was able to continue on. However, the storm separated the fleet, and when the Batavia reached the English Channel, she came across the damaged ships and survivors of the rest of his fleet. One of the ships was so badly damaged it had to return to port for repairs. The six remaining ships continued through the channel into the Atlantic and headed toward the African coast. Cornelis and Jacobs became quick friends aboard the Batavia, mostly over their hatred of Pelzart, speaking openly of him as a tyrant and accusing him of mistreatment of the crew. Cornelis also began to talk of his controversial and heretical beliefs. Educated and charismatic, he bewitched many at the commander's table. Gilbert Bastiens, the predicant, was particularly appalled, although Hieronymus did not divulge anywhere near his true depths of depravity. Lucretia Jans soon caught the interest of Ariane Jacobs. The skipper was known for his womanizing, but Lucretia swiftly rebuked him. Jacobs would soon settle for Lucretia's maidservant, Zwantje. She was quite willing and reportedly refused him nothing. But Hieronymus Cornelis was also taken with Lucretia and sought her attention. But even the smooth-talking Hieronymus was rebuffed by the young woman. Lucretia did, however, befriend Pelsart, who was a bachelor and always interested in the ladies. During this part of the long voyage, the crew and passengers tried to get used to the boredom and monotony of the days. Food and water was always a constant problem. Hardtack often contained weevils or cockroaches, and the barrels of drinking water developed a slime of algae. Conditions on the ship were incredibly miserable, especially for the crew and soldiers. From unsanitary food and water, bed bugs, lack of privacy, no protection from the sun, and the unspeakable awfulness of the latrine, life on a VOC ship was truly a life or death situation. All the while, the officers ate fresh food three times a day, sometimes had 12 course meals, and plenty of beer, wine, spirits, and fresh water. Unexpectedly, Pelzart ordered a stop at Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa. This was highly irregular as the only planned stop was at Table Bay at the Cape of Good Hope. Stopping more than once was strictly forbidden by the VOC, so this was a risky maneuver by Pelzart. The crew called Sierra Leone the white man's grave due to the well-known infestation of malaria and yellow fever. Pelzart undoubtedly risked this extra stop to resupply his ship with food and water and tend to the sick. While in port, the crew came across 15-year-old Abraham Garretts, a deserter from another ship, the Leyden, and he wished to leave with the Batavia. Pelsart agreed and let him join as a working sailor. After Jakob successfully navigated the fleet through the doldrums, he was able to catch the Brazil current and headed east for the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. Ships traveling south from northern European ports would have been at sea for about three to four months by this point, and it was common to start seeing cases of scurvy due to the lack of vitamin C found in their food. Of course, nobody at this time knew the cause of scurvy. The crew of the Batavia fell victim to the disease, and over a dozen men had died before reaching the Cape. On April 14, 1629, the fleet reached the Cape of Good Hope, where the ships were to be restocked and repaired. Pelzart traded metal tools and other trinkets for livestock, fruit, and fresh water with the local Hottentot tribes. While in port at the Cape, a significant incident took place, which contributed to future events. Cornelis, Jacobs, and Zwantje Hendricks spent their nights engaged in wild bouts of drinking and carousing. This is 1629, and at that stage, um, Table Bay... There wasn't anything at any settlement or docks of any sort until, you know, the Dutch came in in the 1650s. So they would simply anchor up there and uh, in shelter and, and they could go ashore, take, you know, sort of unload their bedding and bits and pieces and have a bit of a respite after a long, you know, the first half of the voyage and get ready to set off, give a chance for people to recover, try and do a bit of trading with the local population for stock, for food supplies. So at that time, um, they'd pretty much lost 
the fleet that they'd set out with, they'd lost pretty much lost contact with nearly all of them, a couple just left behind. And there were other ships there as well. So Jacobs decided that he would go around the boats and sort of you know, have a little jaunt around through the other ships and, you know, have a few rums uh, with with each of the, the skippers on board those. And evidently he got himself pretty intoxicated and got himself into some brawls on these ships, which when the, when Pelsar found out about it, you know, this brought great dishonour upon upon um, the VAC company in his, in, in his eyes. You know, um, Jacobs was just having a good time, I think. But Pelsar took the opportunity to to give Jacobs a dressing down, a public dressing down in front of the other crew and so on on board. Now, you can imagine the impact that that would have had on Jacobs. You know, here am I, I'm the skipper of the ship. We've got this sick bloke who's the commander, who only stays in his cabin all the time. You know, so he would have taken it, would have been very humiliating to have had that to happen. So that... That dressing down by Pulsar would have intensified any ill feelings that they might have had between each other, and and obviously you know Pulsar, being a um, a really good company man, would have would have you know been quite serious in his feeling that this was not something that the VOC you know could allow to happen. You know the skipper of one of their ships openly brawling with other ships in the, the table bay. Pulsar later wrote of this. They went ashore without my knowledge, when I had gone in search of beasts, until the evening, when they sailed to the Asendelf, where Arian behaved himself very pugnaciously, and at night time went to the ship Buren, where he behaved himself worse. He was very beastly with words as well as deeds. Pelzart told Jacobs he would report this outlandish behavior to Governor General Kuhn in Batavia when they arrived and warned him that any further offenses would be dealt with harshly, further driving a wedge between these two men. When Jacobs left Pelsart's cabin, he stated publicly to others, quote, By God, if those ships were not lying there, I would treat that miserly dog so that he could not come out of his cabin for 14 days, and I would quickly make myself master of the ship. But I swear, as soon as I go under sail from here, that I soon will be away from the other ships, and then I shall be able to be my own master. This intrigued Hieronymus Cornelis, and he encouraged Jacobs, asking, and how would you manage that? With the skipper openly threatening mutiny and the undermerchant in support, Pelsart's top two subordinates were plotting against him. That's going to do it for part one of Batavia's Graveyard. Because this will be a multi-part episode, I will release part two in just one week rather than two weeks. In the next episode, we will see what happens with the mutiny plot. And this is not a spoiler, how the Batavia meets its demise. Thank you so much to Dr. Howard Gray for joining me from his home in Australia. Dr. Gray has written several books, including the novel Lucretia's Batavia Diary and the nonfiction Spice at Any Price. You can find his books at westralianbooks.com.au and also follow Dr. Gray on Facebook. Links, images, and show notes related to this episode can be found at shipwrecksandseadogs.com. Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is written, edited, and produced by me, Rich Napolitano. You can follow the show at ShipwrecksPod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and on Mastodon at ShipwrecksPod at C, that's the letter C, dot I-M. Also, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the show, and tell a friend. Original theme music is by Sean Siegfried, and you can follow him on YouTube at Sean Secret and on the web at sean.siegfried.se. Please join me again in one week, and until then, don't forget to wear your life jackets.